Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grow My Etsy Shop podcast. So I hope you just enjoyed listening to the sound of plants growing. That is literally what you were just listening to. So today we're going to be talking about what to do if you have a product that isn't selling. Now, there's two different types of Etsy shop owners. There's people who do like make to order, custom orders, and then there's people who have inventory, people who either make all their products at once or they're buying their product from somewhere else or whatever it may be. So this episode is going to be more geared towards those who have inventory. Because if you're making to order, my advice to you would be stop making it or don't make it. But for those who are doing large volumes of orders, you have to have inventory. And I'm telling you right now, inventory is the worst part of owning a business, at least in my opinion. It was a nightmare. It is always a nightmare because it's a game of trying to predict what is the unpredictable. How many of this do I need? Am I going to be under? Am I going to be over? I can't tell you how many times I would get something that would sell off the shelf and it would take me a month before I got it back on the shelf and then I'd get it back on the shelf and it wouldn't sell nearly as well. There's just things that get hot, seasonal trends and we, and you can ride that wave, but having that wave of inventories is rough. So this happens to everyone who has inventory. You have a lot of products that just aren't selling like they should or they used to sell really well and they're not selling anymore or you've never really gotten them to sell and you think they should be selling, but they're not. So we're going to kind of talk about, I have realistically three different scenarios that we can talk about and some advice I would give when I am coaching Etsy shop owners. So one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to look at, is the product itself being seen? Because if you have this product that you believe should be selling and no one's seeing it, that's your problem. So if you didn't listen to the last episode, we actually went over keywords and how to write that out. But what I would do in this scenario is that I would research keywords and I talk about that in the last episode, and I would make sure that my listing is aligned. And once I felt like it was aligned, <laughs> I would turn it off because if it's, it doesn't matter if it's aligned or not, <laughs> it's not working. So turn it off. Now, a lot of people may say, hey, why don't you edit it and then relist it? I tend to be under the belief of there's no point if, uh, if a listing is not being pulled up by Etsy, it's not being tested by Etsy, it might have been tested by Etsy and it wasn't getting the traction that it needed. And so Etsy kind of pushed it back into the back seat. that by you relisting it, you're not doing the algorithm any good. So it's better to deactivate it, rebuild it and relist it with different keywords or different or lining the keywords up differently than it was before. Now, the little extra twist that I put on this is that once it's deactivated, I'm going to rebuild it two or three different times. And I'm going to use different keywords in each of those listings and different pictures in each of those listings. And then I'm going to launch it. So what you're doing is you're giving yourself just percentage wise more of an opportunity for Etsy's algorithm to be able to pick that up and, and drop it on some page that you're targeting with keywords. This is going to help it be seen and really give you the data that you need on whether it is going to sell or it's not going to sell. Another thing that you can do is that you can manually bring that product closer to the front of your store. Now that's not something you need to do for the rest of your life. In fact, what I advise to do is to bring it up for a couple days. So notice its views, notice its looks, and then bring it up for the next, you know, Monday to Thursday and watch it because you're going to have people, the people who are on your actual store are your most targeted audience. Just because someone types in a keyword and they have all these different options doesn't necessarily mean they're interested in your products. But when someone clicks your listing and then enters in your, into your store from that listing, that is a perfect prospect. So now you're going to place the items that you believe are going to sell best to them. And if that product isn't getting any more click or isn't getting any more sales, then it's most likely the product. And I'm going to get into that if it is the product. But let's talk about this scenario. What if you are getting clicks, you are getting views, but no sales? So this is a different problem. So we have to remember that it's people on the other end of these clicks. And that these people make decisions just like you and I do. So if someone is in your store and clicks on your product and doesn't buy it, and you see, you're starting to see a pattern of this, not saying that this is, you, you and I both know as Etsy shop owners, this happens all the time. But if you're seeing a high pattern of this, you know what your conversion rate is and you're seeing, my gosh, this thing does not convert at what my store's conversion rate is. And I'm getting it clicks and it's not converting. It's usually one of two things. You have a price issue or you have a description issue. I tend to start with the description before I revert to my last case scenario, which is to discount the product. Because what a description is, is it's your sales pitch to why they need the product. So if they come to, if they come to your store, click on the listing, read the description and are not sold, what are they going to do? They're going to leave. 
So if you haven't yet, go back to my episode about the three P's and that will help show you how to write a, a description. What a description shouldn't be is a description of your product. This is what it is. This is how long it is. No, 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 no. It should sell the product. So that episode can help you do that. So once you've researched your keywords and you've gone on to Etsy and you've seen where you fall on pages and you realize, oh my gosh, I'm not being seen. So you move this product, you deactivate it, you create it two or three times. You're starting to see more SEO coming from it. You've moved it up into your store. You've placed it next to some of your better sellers. You're seeing more clicks now coming from it. You've rewritten your description. Still no sales. This is where it comes down to either a you're asking for too much money for the product. Keep in mind, Etsy is a competitive place. So if someone makes the decision, I can get that cheaper somewhere else. That's a hard thing to compete against. How many of you in your life have been at a store, held something in your hands, looked at it and said, oh my gosh, I love this. And then thought to yourself, I could probably get it on Amazon for cheaper. It happens to me every time I'm in Barnes and Noble, every time. I look at a book, I start reading it, I enjoy it, and then I think, realistically, this thing's probably seven bucks on Amazon. And it is. So when we're going for that quick buy, we're going for that direct marketing technique of saying, hey, here's a product, come buy it from me. Pricing, unfortunately, does have something to do with it. Not always. And that's what this whole Grow My Etsy shop is about. It's about trying to get away from just competitive pricing and being able to brand yourself properly. But when you have a product that is just not as in demand and you're trying to ask a higher dollar for it, it's a hard sell. So here's what I used to do in my store and here's some of the stuff that I've coached other people that I've seen work really well. So there's the obvious discounted, right? That's the obvious one. Let's just make it on sale and get it off the shelf. Now, I tend to coach to do this even with our best sellers because having a discount is what, you think about any large gathering of shops all together. How do they draw people into there? Think about a mall. When you walk through a mall, you're going to see, hey, our summer dresses are on sale. Hey, we're having this event sale. Hey, it's Labor Day weekend. Come over here and do this. Like They want you to walk into their store because they know if you come into their store looking at their summer dresses, you're going to have a chance to look at other stuff and fall in love with other things. And so I teach it. I promote it. I'm all about that. However, we don't want to discount all of our products. And when we have a couple that are on sale, sometimes it just makes sense that, hey, I'm just going to buy these ones. Or you, of course, you get the messaging of, hey, I noticed that XYZ is on sale, but ABC is not on sale. Can I get ABC at XYZ's price? And then you have to have that awkward conversation of being like, no. <laughs> and so a good technique that we used and I've seen other people use is to bundle. So you take a product that's not selling very well and you bundle it with a product that sells pretty well. And you d think of it this way, the 7-Eleven technique. You've got, you could buy the small Slurpee for a buck 50. You can buy the medium Slurpee for a buck 80, or you can buy the enormous Slurpee for $2. Well, in your mind, you see a dollar 50 is, that's the value of a small one. So technically a big one should be $3, but it's only $2. So you are saving money. This is a great deal. So you're getting that same endorphin rush of like, hey, I'm, I'm hustling the system here. I'm getting, a, I'm getting a discount on what I'm doing. Even though we all know 7-Eleven has priced and makes profit from the big one. They're not, they're not duped when you buy the big one. So you do something similar. You know, let's say your products are normally $20. So you, what you do is you bundle it and you make, if you buy this product, you get this other product and you make it $30. They think they're saving $10 when realistically you're just giving them a product that's not, that doesn't sell as well. And because you're combining the shipping and all that kind of stuff, you're not having to ship it in two different ways. They can save some money. You can save some money. So I started practicing this, especially when I ran my own website, I had the ability to add an upsell at, at checkout. So they would literally buy the product and then they would get a message right after that would say, hey, you just bought XYZ. We're going to send it to you. But if you click this little button and give us an extra $10, we'll throw in this extra thing for you at half price. What that did is it made a customer, instead of being worth $20 to me, be worth $30 to me. So that was able, I was able to increase my marketing because I was increasing how much money I was getting per customer. So even if the, if, even if the profit is $1, you're making $1. If they buy another product at full price, you just increased your price by $1. That's the way to look at it. My last piece of advice is to learn from the mistakes. 
So we all buy things or we have too much inventory or whatever it may be. And to just remember that this is part of owning a business. It is the cost of doing business that you are going to make these mistakes and you'll make them for a long time, but you can get better and see the future a little bit clearer every time you learn from these mistakes. So don't get down on yourself when this happens or don't be feeling like, oh my gosh, my store, no one wants my stuff. No, 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 no. Just make your money back and get back in the game. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't yet, go to growmyetsyshop.com. I've got tons of stuff for you there. Or you can join my Facebook group at facebook.com slash growmyetsyshop.